appreciate it. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, awesome. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few different things tonight. Um, my book, um, uh, The Skeleton Crew, How Amateur Sleuths Are Solving America's Coldest Cases, uh, came out a few years ago. So there's actually been a lot that's been happening in this space. Um, technology moves pretty quickly. So um, there is, uh, there's a kind of a big contrast between the technology I was writing about, uh, which was kind of tracing the early days of the internet and how volunteers were using the tools that were available on the internet at that time to make a sort of revolutionary leap in how um, the public and how law enforcement dealt with uh, missing people and um, unidentified remains, uh, basically Jane and John Doe's. So that's really the focus of my book. Um, tonight, I'm going to address some of that, but I'm also going to go a little broader about how the technology has morphed in the last few years and what's actually happening now with using um, websites, databases, DNA, uh, genetic genealogy to um, identify not only um, criminals, but also Jane and John Doe's, which is really my main focus. Um, so, um, I'm gonna be, I'm just gonna read, some of my presentation is just reading. I'm just looking, if I'm looking a little to the left here, I'm looking at a, um, some summaries that I wanna share with you. So this paragraph about my book uh, was, appeared in the magazine Pacific Standard, and I think it pretty much sums up a major theme. So in the fall of 1987, a high school senior named Todd Matthews became obsessed with his first mystery corpse. The dead woman had been found in 1968 in Georgetown, Kentucky, wrapped in a tarp. People called her Tent Girl. Matthews felt a force urging him to piece together Tent Girl's identity. And for years, he scrutinized every detail the police and journalists might have missed. He dreamed about Tent Girl appearing in his living room. He consulted a psychic. He spent so much time and money looking for Tent Girl that his wife threatened to leave him. Then one night in 1998, he was up past midnight on his compact Presario, one of those little tiny square PCs that is a, looks like a total antique, and he found a missing person's report. Um, when a DNA test confirmed um, that Tent Girl was in fact a young woman named Barbara Taylor, Matthews was in the courthouse conference room when the confirmation came through. Um, it was such an emotional moment for us all, he said. Us all now encompassing Matthews and in the same room, this murder victim's family. Matthews described the emotions, relief, sadness, success. So when I met Todd Matthews, I knew I had to write about him and people like him. Um, so my book came out in 2014, and in it, I really describe, just like, hold me a sec, I'm gonna keep track of my notes. I describe um, volunteers who were spending hundreds of hours using the primitive tools available to them, these web-based tools, uh, to create databases of missing people and unidentified remains. Uh, so in full disclosure, I do not try to solve cold cases um, or cases of Jane and John Doe's myself. Um, a lot of everybody in the book 
does. They're totally dedicated amateur sleuths, volunteers. They give of their time selflessly. Um, it just when it comes up later, if you want to discuss it, I am not on there solving cold cases or knocking on doors or trying to be a law enforcement officer uh, on my own. Um, but back in the early days of the internet, uh, Amateur Slew's biggest accomplishments was creating national centralized repositories of information um, about missing persons and about the unidentified. This was in a time in a world where law enforcement did not communicate well or necessarily at all about missing persons and unidentified remains. So as a total aside, let me get this out of the way because this is just what's going on now. This is a perfect example of an effort that should be separate from police work. And I have written about this. Um, I've heard heartbreaking stories uh, from parents and siblings of missing young adults, especially. Uh, coroners searching for dental records that nobody can find, law enforcement shuffling family members from one jurisdiction to another, um, law enforcement flat out refusing to take or follow up on missing person reports, uh, even though many states consider a missing person under age 21 at high risk of injury or death. The outright lie that a person has to be missing for 24 hours before you can file a police report. Uh, that is simply not true, but that is what many family members have heard. And many missing young adults are, as you can imagine, totally in danger, potentially victims of violent crimes, uh, but lacking an obvious crime scene, police consider the person missing voluntarily. And before you know it, these cases go cold. They go cold very, very, very quickly. Um, so in one Florida case uh, that I've written about, uh, a body that turned up in the Gulf of Mexico went unidentified for two decades, <laughs> for 20 years, even though the victim had been reported missing in the county next to the one where she turned up and was taken out of the Gulf. This would be exactly the kind of thing that could be funded separately from the police, um, an entity devoted uh, just to the missing and unidentified. But I digress. <laughs> okay, so, um, so just back to just an overall view of my book and the people in it. Um, this was um, a time when, as I mentioned, there were very rudimentary tools available on the internet to create databases. You had to be pretty computer savvy to use these tools. Um, so what these people were doing was essentially mining um, traditional sources of information, uh, police, uh, police records, uh, any public records they could find, newspaper archives, um, just even posters stapled to telephone poles. They were gathering this information and logging it into these kind of makeshift databases. So um, this was um, unusual to say the least. Uh, there had never been kind of a national effort and a lot of these people were actually scattered around the world uh, working on this. So they would create a database of whatever they could dig up about Jane and John Doe's from around the country. Uh, they put in as many details as were accessible. Um, usually it was height and weight, presumed age, uh, where the person had been found, uh, the circumstances under which they'd been found, Sometimes uh, it was only bones because it had been so long. Um, and then they created a, another database of um, missing persons. Uh, and that was, again, you know, whatever they could find from police records or notices or um, newspaper articles. So now they had these kind of parallel databases. 
And what the web sleuths, these very early web sleuths, kind of the first web sleuths 101, what they were doing was just looking through each database in the hope that they could notice a detail that would indicate that there was a match, that missing person A was Jane Doe A. And it was totally labor intensive, incredibly difficult, um, time consuming. Uh, it took, you know, hours and hours and hours. And these people normally had day jobs. They were already working uh, full time. And they did this on their, you know, uh, old clunky computers um, at night or in their off hours or on weekends. And they actually managed to do this. They actually managed to find, um, to make matches. And then they would present these matches to law enforcement. Um, and they would have to, uh, they were kind of at the, the mercy of whether law enforcement believed them or not, or followed up on their tips or not, and um, how that played out and whether they would get any credit or not. And usually they didn't. They usually didn't get any credit or very little credit from law enforcement. Um, but they felt compelled to do this. Um, I used to, right after my book came out, uh, I used to get asked a lot, uh, how would you describe an amateur sleuth, a web sleuth? What, what are they like? What, is, what are their characteristics? Um, so I'd say all the things I just mentioned about their persistence and their uh, dedication and their time and their attention to detail. But another thing about them that was really stood out to me was that they really wanted to help. They wanted to help these families who had lost somebody. And they either knew that experience firsthand, like it had happened to somebody in their own family, or they knew of someone who had helped ask them to help search for a missing loved one. Um, but they wanted to provide closure to these families um, because it is, I think the worst thing in the world not to know what's happened to somebody that you love and has been important to you and um, you just have no idea where they are, whether they are happy where they are, whether they're living a life that they just don't want to be contacted from or that they're just, they've befallen some terrible fate. So it's, it's really, um, it's really an emotional exercise to to do this and to hear from these people and to talk to the kinds of people who devote so much time and effort to, to doing this. Um, so let me just switch gears a little and talk about um, the latest uh, uses of some of this technology and just how much it has advanced just in, just in a pretty short time, just in the last five years. So um, I'll bet many of you know that in April 2018, um, a California man uh, who was accused of a series of decades old rapes and murders, um, who had been dubbed uh, the Golden State Killer, uh, was identified with uh, the help of genetic genealogy using a site called GEDmatch. So GEDmatch is a kind of um, a repository where people can upload um, their DNA that they have had um, uh, developed, uh, DNA that they've had analyzed by other websites, other services like 23andMe or Ancestry.com. So once you get your DNA back, you can upload it to this database called GEDmatch. So I'm going to read to you a little bit of a scientific study that came out in 2018, the same year that um, the Golden State Killer was identified using this uh, database. So um, this was a study that was done 
on the use of this kind of, uh, on this method. So law enforcement, and I'm just, I'm just kind of reading the summary. Law enforcement used a long range familial search to trace the Golden State Killer. Investigators generated a genome-wide profile of the perpetrator from a crime scene sample. Just a little aside, I, I think I remember reading that they stole something out of his trash, you know, something he would have had some DNA on, whether it was something he drank from or fingernail clippings or hair or something like that. So they literally went to his trash on the sidewalk and uh, got something that they could get a DNA sample from. So they uploaded uh, the profile of his, his DNA, uh, who they didn't, uh, they suspected was the perpetrator, but they did not know for sure, um, to GEDmatch, a database that contains about a million, at the time, a million uh, DNA profiles. So the GEDmatch search identified it, uh, a third degree cousin of this individual. Um, and extensive genealogical data traced the identity of the perpetrator, which was confirmed by a standard DNA test. Um, so, okay, so they've got, they, you know, from all the rape kits and the, um, the murder uh, victim sites, uh, they have now matched DNA from all those crimes to um, this man who was a former police officer. Um, you know, I, I suspect you've all read about the, this uh, amazing identification decades after the fact of the Gold State Killer, but if you haven't, please go check it out. Um, and there's a, a, a nonfiction book about the case, um, which is totally fascinating. Anyway, so after the next few months after his identification, between April and August 2018, at least 13 cases were reportedly solved by long range familiar searches. These are criminal cases. So most of these investigations focused on cold cases. Um, for which, you know, for decades, they had not been able to solve these cases, super cold cases. Um, so, um, but there was one case among them that was recent. It was at the time, it was from April, 2018. Um, so that meant that some law enforcement agencies were using, were just suddenly started using um, long range familial DNA searches as an active form of investigation. So, uh, and there was even a, um, a new company in Virginia, in Western Virginia, called Parabon Nano Labs, uh, a forensic DNA company uh, that set up a new division that they, so they were going to use long range familial searches to just look at cold cases in general. And they had already uploaded uh, DNA from 100 cold cases um, to GenMatch. So um, according to this study, all of these lines of evidence suggest that long range familial searches may become a standard investigative tool. So in other words, law enforcement really wanted to do this in a big way. Um, so just a, in a kind of a, a really simplistic view of how this works. So DNA is collected from a crime scene the raw data is uploaded to the website. An algorithm matches the DNA to someone who had uploaded their own DNA in the hope of finding a long lost relative or better understanding of their own an ancestry. So let's say, so there's a match. Let's say there's a match. So a genetic genealogist then begins to build a family tree. Uh, so investigators collect DNA uh, from the extended from the extended family of the uh, suspected uh, perpetrator, and uh, one of these people may end up being the suspect, the one whose DNA was present at the crime scene. Um, so this all seemed really promising. Uh, there were all these cases in the works. Um, 
But then right after that scientific study came out, which I think made it obvious that this was going to be um, a huge tool for law enforcement. Um, after that came out, GEDmatch suddenly switched gears. They decided that they were going to set, um, just as a, a, a preset device, if you logged onto their site, if you wanted to upload your DNA, they were going to make it so that you were not, your DNA was not searchable by law enforcement. Um, so that is actually the current state. Uh, you can choose to opt in. You would have to give consent to be searchable uh, by law enforcement. Um, so all, but all users are now by default excluded from law enforcement searches unless they explicitly choose to opt in. So, and so few users are now opting in that it's only about 163,000 out of um, GEDmatch's 1.3 million sets of uploaded DNA. Um, so that's made GEDmatch really very marginally useful um, as a device for using, for, you know, um, pinpointing a criminal suspect. Um, so that's a, that's a big change, and that was not what I think a lot of people think is going on right now. I think they believe that law enforcement is actively doing this and that they are just plugging in DNA left and right, and they're finding all these um, perpetrators. But that is actually... Um, after the Golden State Killer, that is actually not really happening in a big way. Uh, but finding criminals aside, what I find incredibly exciting is um, the ability to use DNA to identify Jane and John Doe's. Um, so that company I mentioned before, the one in Virginia, um, can actually use DNA to create what they call a snapshot genotype. Um, they can predict, using just DNA, they can predict what a person looked like. Uh, they can predict eye, skin, eye color, skin color, hair color, um, even the shape of a face. And it's a little hard to get your head around how this is all encoded in our DNA, but it is. And, um, and these high-tech companies like this one um, can do this. So when I wrote about amateur sleuths a few years ago, um, their su successes were pretty amazing, but they were rare. They were not something that happened all that much. So like I said, their tools were memory, um, you know, how if they remembered seeing something, persistence, you know, they would look through these thousands of data points in the hope of matching an unidentified body with a missing person. Um, so I'm just gonna run through a handful of people who were success stories that are, these are all in my book. So um, Greg May, he was murdered, um, dismembered. His body parts were scattered around Iowa and Missouri by a man he had considered his best friend. Arthur Westfall Jr. had been bound and killed and dumped by an unknown assailant on a Utah mountain trail. Sean Lewis Cutler, buried without his wheelchair in a shallow grave in Vermont. Peter Kokonakis from Houston, found floating in a river west of Boston. Brenda Sue Wright, a skeleton. She was nothing but a skeleton in a Baltimore industrial park. Maurice Marciano, whose suicide note in Phoenix was only signed M. So all these people had spent years as Jane and John Doe's, and they were all identified with the help of amateur sleuths. Um, so I still, I'm, uh, you know, whenever an unidentified 
body turns up that I'm still, it's still on my radar. So um, just a few years ago, uh, the torso, it was just a torso, a torso of a victim was found um, on the dunes at uh, Town Neck Beach in Sandwich. Um, the torso was wrapped in layers of plastic and a tarp. Uh, the torso, it was literally just a torso, um, dressed in a t-shirt from Windustrial Supply Company in Cranston, Rhode Island. And so law enforcement has uh, surmised that the limbs were removed maybe to get rid of a tattoo that was very identifiable. Um, uh, the victim's DNA didn't turn up in any national databases, um, but a DNA generated image has put a face to this man's bare bones information. Um, Robert, I don't know if you have that uh, image handy. Um, so, so it's, it's pretty, it, it's, it's amazing to me, but based on DNA alone, um, this high tech company has come up with this reconstruction of what this individual, um, would have looked like in life. And they're just hoping that if they can disseminate this composite image, uh, this thing that looks almost like a photograph, uh, that they can help identify this victim who was so brutally murdered. Um, he deserves, uh, everybody deserves so much more than this. Um, and help identify the victim, which will in turn help uh, lead to his killer. Um, so the nonprofit DNA Doe project is focused solely on these kinds of cases. And um, they have um, actually managed to identify, um, using the same techniques that I described on GenMatch, they had, just, they had actually identified a couple of dozen Jane and John Does, which was huge. They, in a short period of time, they managed to identify many more people than the web sleuths had over years because they had these tools at their, um, at their disposal. Um, so to come full circle, Todd Matthews, uh, who was featured in my book, who for a long time worked for um, the national database that grew out of the volunteer databases that he helped found, uh, like the Doe Networks, the, there uh, was established a national database called the National Missing and Unidentified Person System, also known as NamUs. Um, which is just a very elaborate, uh, high-tech version of those uh, primitive databases I described where there was a parallel database of the missing and the unidentified. And by the way, anybody can go look at these databases. You can log into NamUs, you can search your town, your state, and I guarantee you will be shocked at how many unidentified remains there are just pretty much everywhere. Um, so the founders of the DNA Doe Project are hoping that DNA can help identify some of the Jane and John Does. Um, and they are encouraging uh, people who have uploaded to GEDmatch to opt in, to do that thing that you now have to choose to do, which is to make your DNA um, accessible to law enforcement, to researchers and others. Um, and they, and they, are, they totally understand the privacy issues and um, they point out that you can use uh, an alias, you can create an email address that is solely for this purpose. Um, you don't have to um, really have all of yourself out there. Uh, but they're hoping that people might be willing to opt in, uh, if not for criminals, maybe just to help give identities back to uh, Dane and John Doe's. You know, people might be willing um, to submit their DNA to, um, to have this be an option. 
And, um, you know, and for now, if you're stuck, uh, you know, if you're home more than you would have been otherwise because of the pandemic, you know, maybe check out some of these things, DNA, Doe Project, um, uh, NamUs, um, because as Todd Matthews says, um, you know, part of the battle is just keeping these cases um, in the public eye, just just having people read about them, having people know that they're out there, having people know that their families don't know where they are. And um, we just, as he says, we have to make sure these stories remain important. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Deborah. A wonderful job, a really fascinating stuff. Uh, so at this time, uh, we'll move into a Q&A and uh, maybe take 10 to 15 minutes of uh, questions. Uh, if anyone uh, has any questions, uh, feel free to type them into the chat. Uh, if you'd like to ask your question via video, um, just let me know by either physically raising your hand, or if I can't see you, you can use the virtual hey, um, raise hand feature that Zoom has. Uh, privately, Deborah, I got a couple of requests and I was multitasking while you're, you were talking, I won't lie. But I, I know that you referenced an article, a science article uh, during your presentation. Yeah. Uh, what was the title of that article? Somebody wanted me to try to find it and uh, a couple people asked about it. They want me to link it in the comments if I can find it. Okay, yeah, I will, I will find that uh, for you. Let me... Um, uh, it was, uh, yeah, I think it was in, in cell, but let me, uh, let me just search through my uh, history here and, and dig it up. But uh, go ahead, I'm, I'm, I'm listening. Great. All right, so you'll multitask too. So yeah. uh, questions are coming in now. Uh, Jean wants to know, are there any instances where genetic genealogy identified both a victim and a killer? Um... Oh, I see. You mean, it, it, does that mean like where the, um, the, uh, the victim had been unidentified and the genetic genealogy helped give the person a name and then also uh, determined uh, the murderer? Um, I'm gonna have to say I, I, I do not know for a fact that that has ever happened. I think, um, I think that would be um, I think that would be a major accomplishment if it did, because each of these things is so fraught. It's so difficult to do. It, it's not like just a name pops up, you know, somebody, uh, uh, somebody pops up as having, you know, a, a section of DNA that seems like it could be related, and then you have to create like a whole family tree and it's not, it's not terribly cut and dry. So um, I think that would be an extraordinary um, uh, coup if anybody did manage uh, to do both of those. Um, but I can, I'm more than happy to, to, try to, to try to find out. By the way, you, you referenced the um, Golden State Killer, and it uh, looks like HBO is coming out with a, like a six-part documentary series. I think it starts next Sunday, so. Yeah, uh, I saw that. Yeah, everyone should keep an eye on that. Uh, Megan wants to know, do you think social media and or the popularity of cold case type shows have helped with this kind of thing? Absolutely. Um, there are an extraordinary um, number of people on uh, subgroups of Reddit, for instance, that uh, they're totally dedicated, these subgroups are completely dedicated to even sometimes just one, one Jane Doe or one John Doe. Um, people have become very um, obsessive about these cases um, because when you'll see if you start looking at um, the details, if you start seeing some of these images, like the one you just showed of the, the reconstruction of the victim from uh, Sandwich, Massachusetts, you just really get drawn in. So, um, so absolutely, just, you know, anybody coming across any kind of mention uh, of any of these individuals, I, I personally find them incredibly uh, compelling to just start reading about. It just, 
is completely mind boggling that nobody, you know, I mean, I'm sure people are missing them. It just seems like nobody's missing them, some of them, because how could they not have been found? Uh, um, a very famous local case, which I go into extensively in my book, is the Lady of the Dunes in Provincetown, Mass. Um, just reading the details about her, it's just, you just cannot understand how nobody has ever seen over the decades since she was murdered any details about her and recognized her. So it, it's very, it's very compelling. And social media absolutely um, makes a very big difference. Uh, Jessica would like to know, how did you get started uh, researching sleuths? <laughs> um, yeah, as you can probably tell from my bio, I'm actually um, a science writer and I worked for academia. And, um, so it was, um, I had actually pitched a book, uh, the book that I intended to write way back when I was, um, when I was pitching my first book uh, was a biography of a scientist. And uh, <laughs> for a number of reasons, it did not work out. Um, but it was right about that time that um, I came across The Lady of the Dunes. Um, I just started Googling this whole notion of unidentified remains. And I came up with these crazy numbers like a uh, a study had shown that there were maybe 40,000 sets of these unidentified remains just around the country um, in, you know, it kind of stowed away in morgues or in coroner's offices or buried in uh, pauper's graves. And then I came across the Doe Network and I spoke to Todd Matthews and that was it. I was like, <laughs> this is crazy. I, I need to know more about this. Uh, Kathleen would like to know, uh, well, Kathleen notes that uh, she had her DNA done by Ancestry. And she's wondering, is that part of the national database that the police use? Uh, no, not automatically. So, um, so if, you, if you have had your DNA done by 23andMe or Ancestry.com, um, they have their own um, privacy uh, rules and regulations. So the, the thing that the uh, law enforcement was using is just this very specific site called GEDmatch, um, which I don't think uh, did anybody's DNA um, on its own. I think the only way it worked was as a repository. So if you chose to, you could upload the DNA that you, uh, the a profile that you received when you paid for it to get it done, you can upload it to GEDmatch. And I think that just gave you a much bigger uh, database uh, to draw from to look for um, potential relatives. And GEDmatch was the one um, that law enforcement was using up until 2018 uh, when they are now, uh, they started requiring people to opt in for law enforcement use. Uh, somewhat related question from Lauren. Uh, she says, when you send your DNA into a genealogy website, does it belong to the Mormon church? Much like anything posted to Facebook becomes owned by Facebook. How much is your consent worth? Uh, again, I'm not an expert on this, but um, I believe that each of these uh, different places um, does have its own uh, privacy rules and regulation and privacy is becoming, uh, I mean, they, uh, since I will find uh, the name of that study I was citing, uh, but especially since then, I think uh, privacy um, is becoming much more of um, something that is uh, in, under the control of the individual. So, um, so uh, I think uh, unless you uh, purposefully share um, your information, I would hope that it is not searchable by the Mormon church or, or anyone. I mean, there's a bit of a, I mean, I know on Facebook, you can um, opt in for a setting where they do not, uh, they cannot use your photos or do they not, they cannot own them. I'm not, believe me, I'm not 
an expert on this, but it's a very tricky subject. And um, I would encourage you to go into the fine print of anything and just make sure that your privacy settings are the way you want them. Uh, so we'll take questions for a few more minutes. I uh, want to encourage anyone to get their questions into the chat if they haven't already. And uh, you know what, Deborah, don't worry about that study. Um, just email email me the name yeah. of the study afterwards and I'll include it in tomorrow's email when I send out the feedback survey. Oh, perfect. Yeah, yeah so I, uh, I will do that. Yeah, we won't rush uh, to try to find that. Okay, so okay. We'll, we'll take about five more minutes here. Uh, Jean wants to know, is there a source online that tracks cases solved by genetic genealogy? Um, well, again, that can be a link that I can, um, I can probably dig up. Um, I was looking at a few of them today and, and they were, and it's a bit scattered. I don't know that there's one place that's gonna tell you all the uh, cases solved or the Jane and John Doe's. I mean, the DNA Doe Project does list um, on their website, their solves. And they are, they are honestly amazing because I came across a lot of these cases when I was writing my book uh, a few years ago. And I, these cases were so old. I mean, decades old. Uh, some of them, you know, it, it was mind boggling to me that they would ever be solved. And uh, they have actually solved some of them. So um, uh, it, it, it really is spectacular what they've been able to do. Uh, Casey would like to know, do you think local governments or police departments will start to hire more people in the future to use genealogy to help solve cases? We are currently watching everything unfold in real time, and I'm curious how you think this will all look five to ten years down the road. Well, it's very, it's, it's a very interesting question. Um, I was reading this impassioned uh, plea by one of the founders of the DNA Doe Project uh, for people to opt in. You know, um, uh, as she mentioned, you know, there are ways to do it to retain your privacy, but yet still opt in. So she, she was envisioning a world um, 10 years from now uh, where people are opting in. Uh, pretty much everyone is opting in, um, and, uh, and, and it does uh, become the thing it seemed to be about to launch in 2018, which was a way to, you know, a way to identify perpetrators from decades old uh, cold cases. Um, I mean, it's, um, it seems like people would want to help with that. Um, and, and, and I think it will, and you know, it's, it's a unclear to me how much privacy we have in any realm anymore anyway, and it's certainly critical to maintain our privacy as much as we can. Um, on the other hand, maybe there will be ways in the future where we can retain our personal privacy, yet um, use our personal DNA profiles for larger causes. Among them, let me point out, is uh, things like uh, curing cancer. Um, you know, uh, they, there are uh, systems that kind of comb, you know, just general DNA, human DNA, in an effort to um, come up with cures for cancer. There are some people who will never get cancer. And uh, if they can figure out why that is and uh, expand it to the general population, it could save a lot of lives. So it, it's, it's definitely a very exciting um, potential for the future. Great, great. Well, I think that that's it for questions. I think we had about 10 questions from the chat, so that was fantastic. Um, was there anything that uh, you'd like to add that you maybe didn't cover in the last, in the last 45 minutes? And anything you want to leave us with? No, I'm just I'm just excited to to talk about this to um, to share my experiences with this because I never knew about this kind of thing. I, I and and it's just something you can really get sucked into, but in in a good way because it really is ultimately um, helping people. Great, great. Well, on that note, uh, we will uh, we'll wrap here. 
So uh, let's uh, everyone please give a big virtual round of applause to Deborah for joining us here tonight. Uh, thank you so much, Deborah. You did a wonderful job. And um, so just as a reminder, folks, I'll send an email tomorrow morning. Um, and if you could uh, fill out that feedback survey, it would be greatly appreciated. Uh, there will be an option in that feedback survey, a spot where you can um, type comments into De for Deborah, and I'll make sure to pass them along to her. So thank you all so much for coming. You still get time to go watch the final Jeopardy question, okay? <laughs> Everyone have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Good night.